Hey everyone, and welcome to our second small business update. I'm Jeanette Mulvey, the content director of Co from the US Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for being here today. In late December, the president signed into law a $900 billion coronavirus relief package. And this new law has big implications for small businesses. And we're going to break them down today and talk about them and how they can help you. We will walk through the details of the Paycheck Protection Program and the new PPP second draw. And we will also talk about the employee retention tax credit, the targeted idle grant, and the live venue grant. In the second half of the program, we will take audience questions. So be sure to type your questions into the space on the right-hand side of the screen. And you can do that at any time from now going forward. And if you see a question there that you like, be sure to click the thumbs up button to move it higher on the list so we know which are the most popular questions. Now, I would like to introduce Neil Bradley, who's the Executive Vice President and Chief Policy Officer here at the US Chamber of Commerce. Hi, Neil. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, Jeanette. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. So let's just dive right in because there's a lot to cover. Maybe you could go over these two kind of key things, the employee retention tax credit and then the new second draw PPP loan, uh, which are both pretty big for small businesses. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about those, how they work and who qualifies. Absolutely. Um, I think we have a slide that we can bring up that'll hit a couple key points that I want people to focus in on. Um, the employee retention tax credit, which we haven't talked about as much before. If I could leave people with one takeaway, it's going to be pay attention to this tax credit. What does it do? Beginning January 1st, 2021, a refundable, advanceable tax credit of up to $14,000 per employee. Who can qualify? Generally, if you have fewer than 500 employees and you've experienced more than a 20% decline in gross receipts, in a quarter compared to the same quarter in 2019, meaning pre-pandemic, you can qualify for this tax credit. And of course, we'll talk about the second draw PPP loans, which is a forgivable loan of up to $2 million. It has all the similar features of the original PPP program, but it's targeted to those businesses with fewer than 300 employees who've exhausted their first PPP loan and who are experiencing more than a 25% drop and gross receipts in a quarter of 2020 compared to the same quarter in 2019. So these are probably the two biggest programs that are available to help small businesses uh, going forward. Just a quick clarification on that. For the employee retention tax credit, it's for two quarters, correct? You can get the credit for two quarters? That's exactly right. So the figures we just gave you are based, it's, it's authorized uh, and in law for the first quarter of 2021 and the second quarter of 2021. And I should flag, a lot of our listeners may have heard about this before. There was uh, an employee retention tax credit included in the original CARES Act way back in the spring of 2020. It was a smaller credit um, and small businesses had to choose between taking a PPP loan and getting the employee retention tax credit. So a lot of people gravitated to the PPP because frankly, it was, a, it was a better deal. Congress has removed that prohibition about taking advantage of both. So now if you got a PPP loan in 2020, you can take advantage of the employee retention tax credit in 2021. And you may even be able to apply a part of it looking backwards to part of your expenses in, in 2019. So this is uh, really a brand new opportunity for a lot of small businesses, and frankly, a more generous opportunity than what was originally included in the CARES Act. And this would be something that businesses would file during their regular tax filing? So, uh, that, that, so that it's a little bit different than that, and that even makes it more attractive. So um, most of us think about tax credits, and we think about okay, well, you know, April fifteenth, I'm doing my taxes, and you know, I can take advantage of tax credit then. This is a tax credit that's applied against what employers remit for withholding for the the typical uh, payroll tax withholding, your Social Security withholding for your employees, which is obviously paid much more frequently. It's a refundable credit, meaning that if your expenses, your, your eligible credit exceeds your level of taxes, the IRS sends you a check 
for the difference. Let me repeat that. The IRS sends you a check for the difference between your taxes paid or that you would have paid and what you're eligible for for the tax credit. And importantly, you can even apply at the IRS to receive an advance on this tax credit. So to help with cash flow issues, it's what's called an advanceable tax credit. So um, it really is a great opportunity for small businesses. If you have five, it's, a, it's eligible for, for all businesses, but it's most targeted for those with 500 or fewer employees. If that's you, this is a great thing to talk to your tax accountant or your bookkeeper about to understand how this employee retention tax credit can offset some of your wage expenses for the first six months of 2021. So to clarify, you would go to your accountant, but basically you would file a form with the IRS to claim this tax credit. That, that's exactly right. And because it's done um, as part of what your normal remittance are for your payroll tax withholdings, it's much more frequent than your, you know, even quarterly or annual tax filing. So um, it, it's just an opportunity to take advantage of that. Um, and, and importantly, if you're talking, if, if, if this is something that um, is attractive uh, to you as a small business, one of the things that you ought to ask your, um, your, your bookkeeper, your tax uh, preparer about is looking back into 2019 because this, this, or excuse me, in 2020, this tax credit was also available in 2020. And there's the ability to look back and claim the tax credit for some of the wages that you paid your employees in calendar year 2020. And so um, think about the, it, it, for 2020, it's only a $5,000 credit. So it's not as generous as the $14,000 uh, maximum credit in 2021, but still $5,000 per employee. It's worth talking to your, your accountant, your bookkeeper, your tax preparer to understand if you can take advantage of that for the year that just closed. So if this is against payroll uh, taxes, then I guess if you have a payroll company, this is that you should be talking to them as well if they're the ones deducting the payroll taxes on your behalf, correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. And so I, I know a lot of folks use payroll companies. Um, the IRS is uh, for the earlier version of the tax credit has provided guidance for payroll tax companies to help them implement this on behalf of their customers. And so um, if, if you use one of those companies, talk to them. Uh, I, we've been talking to them. I expect they'll have lots of information for you as well to figure out how you take advantage of this. And, and just remember, um, it used to be that you couldn't take advantage of the PPP and this, now you can, that's the big difference. That's why it's so attractive for folks to take a look at right now. And just to clarify, we do you know what the deadline is yet right now for taking advantage of the employee retention tax credit it would have to be after the second quarter of 2021, correct? If well, so it, you, you would take advantage of it. So if you would look back, if you're looking back mm -hmm. to 2020 wages, you'd be taking advantage of that in the next month or so. You obviously take advantage of it over the first six months of 2021. That's when you have eligible expenses. So wages that you pay after the first six months of 2021 won't qualify for the tax credit. But right now we're in the period where if you're paying wages, they can qualify for the tax credit if you meet the employee headcount threshold and you meet the test for a 20% reduction in gross receipts. Got it. Okay. Um, let's talk about the PPP second draw. Um, can you just explain a little bit more about how, what that means and how it relates to the original PPP? Sure. So the, the second draw PPP is really an opportunity for the hardest hit small businesses to get an, another loan uh, based on their uh, payroll costs that can also be forgiven. This loan's a little bit different in the sense that it's more targeted than the original PPP loan. So some of the qualifications here, you have to have 300 or fewer employees. That's down from the 500 employee limit under the original PPP program. Here, you also have to meet a revenue reduction test. You'll recall under the original PPP program, it was a simply an attestation that your business was being harmed uh, economically by the pandemic. Here, you have to demonstrate that you've had a reduction in gross receipts in a quarter in 2020 of 25% or greater 
relative to the same quarter in 2019. So if your uh, business was only off, let's say 5%, you won't qualify for the second draw PPP, even though you may have qualified and may have received the first round of PPP. Importantly, you have to exhaust your original PPP loan in order to get the second draw PPP. Doesn't mean you have to have completed the forgiveness process. You simply have had to expend all the funds you received under that original PPP by the time you receive your second draw PPP. Got it. Okay. So are these second draws available yet? And if I were a business and wanted, first of all, do I apply for the first? Do I apply for the second? So how will that all play out from a yeah, great Business question. Standpoint. So we're, um, we're waiting for the Small Business Administration uh, to reopen the portal uh, for uh, the PPP program and the second draw PPP program, and importantly, issue guidance to both small businesses and lenders. Um, so this will work, uh, and, and I, I, should, I should emphasize a point there. We spend a lot of time talking about the second draw PPP, but remember, the original PPP program under this new law has been reopened. You'll recall that it shut down uh, in September of last year and was not issuing new loans. It will reopen and issue new loans to small businesses who meet the qualifications who haven't received a loan yet. So uh, when the Small Business Administration opens the portal and, uh, and releases the guidance, if you have never received a PPP loan, you have an opportunity to go to your lender and apply for original PPP. If you received a PPP loan and you exhausted it and you meet the qualifications that we just talked about, the revenue reduction, 300 or fewer employees, then you can go to your lender and file an application for a second draw PPP program. You might not get as much money. The, the caps are a little bit different this time. It's a $2 million cap but it's a great opportunity for those businesses who've used up all their original PPP funds and are looking for additional support. Great, okay. Um, tell us a little bit though, the rules have also changed around the first PPP loans. So can you just tell us how those rules have changed? Sure. Um, you know, it, it's not like a government program. But they're not constantly tinkering, tinkering with the rules. So here's a few things um, uh, to keep in mind. Perhaps the single most important, we've gotten a lot of questions about this, is the taxability of your PPP loan. So Congress has clarified in this new, this new law that your PPP loan forgiveness is not taxable. And in addition to that, the expenses that you paid with your PPP loan funds remain deductible as ordinary business expenses, just like you would deduct the expense if you had used other revenue to pay for it. So there are no tax consequences for receiving your PPP loan. That's perhaps the most important because prior to this law, a lot of small businesses were just suddenly learning of a surprise tax bill they were gonna receive. This wipes that out, no more surprise tax bills. In addition, uh, the list of eligible expenses for which uh, a PPP loan can be forgiven has, has been expanded. It includes um, the expenses that small businesses have made uh, for uh, public health measures. Uh, you know, lots of businesses have installed plexiglass. A lot of folks have implemented drive-through windows, for example, or created partitions uh, to comply with public health recommendations. Those expenses are now countable uh, as a forgivable uh, PPP expenditures. Uh, the same is true if you have essential supplier goods. So um, if you have uh, uh, perishable items that you order for your business that are essential to the operation of the business, those can count as eligible expenses for which you can receive forgiveness. The one important caveat, however, is that the 60-40 rule remains in effect. The 60-40 rule says that 60% of your expenses, of your total amount of loan forgiveness, have to be for payroll expenses related to your employees. So um, you, can, you can increase your loan forgivability because of these other eligible expenses, but still 60% of whatever you're uh, eligible for, for forgiveness has to have gone towards paying your employees. Got it. 
Um, so let's talk about some of the other programs that are available. These are just two. Um, let's. There are a few others that I think we should highlight. Yeah, let's talk about the uh, IDLE grants, uh, for example, and the live venue grants. And we have a slide here, too, that we'll bring up that might help uh, uh, kind of illuminate what's going on here. People may remember the IDLE grants. This is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. That's a typical loan program operated by the SBA. By the way, that's gonna be reopening, taking uh, loan applications as well. But in addition, there was a targeted grant of $10,000 for small businesses. Uh, this ran out of money several times. A lot of small businesses thought they were gonna get $10,000. They only ended up getting 1,000 or $2,000. Um, and Congress has re-upped that but with a little bit of a twist, they've given priority for small businesses that have 300 or fewer employees that are located in a census tract that's eligible for the new market tax credit. And if you don't know that applies to you or not, you can simply Google new market tax credit maps and they'll pull up maps uh, that'll show you which census tracts qualify. And you've had to experience a 30% reduction in gross receipts for an eight week period between March 2nd of last year and the end of the year compared to a similar eight week period either before the pandemic or in the prior year. If you meet all of those qualifications, then you're gonna be at the front of the line for receiving that full idle grant. If you never received one, you can get the full $10,000. If you received a partial idle grant, let's say you got $7,000 before, you can reapply to get the additional $3,000. So um, this is a great opportunity, particularly for small businesses located in low-income neighborhoods uh, to access a, a grant that is specifically set aside for them. And it's a grant. You don't have to repay it. Great. Let, I know that um, the new stimulus package also set aside um, money specifically for minority owned businesses. So can you just talk a little bit about that and what those business owners can do to take advantage of that? Yeah, so there are several set asides in, in the new law. The probably the most important are set asides, uh, very similar to what happened when the PPP was replenished last summer that are for community development financial institutions and small credit unions and small banks. So um, there's a, you know, a set aside uh, four loans made by those institutions. In addition, and that, that operates very similar to what we saw last summer. In addition, there are set asides for businesses in, with 10 or fewer employees who are receiving therefore smaller loans under $250,000 located in low income areas. And so this is an issue that we're waiting further guidance on from SBA, but there is gonna be some prioritization and some set-asides to ensure that uh, small businesses in low-income neighborhoods or who use smaller lenders or traditional minority-serving lenders have access to this program. Okay, so that's great information. And I am going to go to the audience soon. So audience, keep typing your questions. And Neil, I have a couple more for you. I know there were some changes in terms of the rules around nonprofits and what nonprofit organizations could qualify for these programs. Can you just give us some more information on that? Yeah, the biggest change was in the PPP program for what are called 501c6 institutions. Uh, these are local chambers of con uh, commerce or direct marketing organizations. Think, you're, think about your travel and tourism promotion, uh, nonprofits uh, in, in your local community. Originally, they weren't eligible for the PPP program because it was restricted only to 501c3 organizations. Those are your typical welfare type charity uh, programs. This has now been expanded to include 501c6s. Um, there are certain eligibility requirements that are specific to those in terms of employment uh, and lobbying expenditures and other things. Uh, but if you happen to be AC6, you are newly eligible uh, for the PPP program. Got it. Thank you. Um, one more. Uh, just this is a lot of information for small businesses. Uh, just like what are the two, three things they could do just right now to just get a head start on this and start applying? 
So I, I think the first thing to do is, is get a strategy. So where, where are you going to go first? Um, and so I, I think a couple ways to think, because you're going to go to different places for different programs. So we talked about those three. We also uh, we kind of skipped over the live venue program. Let's oh, bring yes. that slide back up really quick. Um, if you happen to be a live venue operator, um, that means that you're a, a, a live event business, a promoter, you're a theatrical producer, live performing arts organization, a museum, an independent motion picture theater, or talent representative, then you're going to want to pay attention to that live venue grant program uh, because that is specifically tailor designed for you. It offers more money than the PPP program uh, and it's a direct grant rather than a forgivable loan. If you are uh, one of those uh, smaller uh, businesses in one of those new market tax credit areas, meaning a low income community, and you're looking for a simple grant, you're going to want to focus on the target idle grant. For both of those programs, you're gonna go straight to the Small Business Administration. The Small Business Administration will administer both of these programs. Now, neither one are currently up and running at the moment, but they will be in the days and weeks ahead. And so you're gonna to wanna to familiarize yourself with the SBA uh, websites and those direct applications. Now, if you're thinking about a PPP loan, either a first loan because you never received one or a second draw loan, that's going to be through your banking institution. And so you're going to want to be getting ready, talking to your lender, talking to your bank about getting your application in either for the original PPP loan or for the second draw PPP. And so you're going to focus your efforts there talking with your lender. If you're focused on the employee retention tax credit, you're going to be talking to your tax preparer, your accountant, whoever helps you with those submissions, whoever in your operation, um, who is doing those tax submissions, you're going to be wanting to get that ready. And, you know, you may be in a situation which you're pursuing multiple of these angles at once, but we're just remember, you're going to different people to apply for and receive these different benefits. Got it. Okay. I think we're ready to go to the audience question. So thank you, first of all, Neil. Um, so our first question is about 1099 independent contractors. So what period of income will they use to qualify and to calculate their loan at 2.5 times monthly income? Yeah, so uh, you may recall independent contractors and the self-employed uh, under the original PPP program were eligible uh, for uh, a loan that could be forgiven. They remain eligible either for an original PPP program or for the second draw PPP if they've exhausted their original PPP loan. Um, the, there are different time periods that folks will look back to calculate that, particularly for 1099s, you're looking at um, your prior year records, generally your 2019 records, and what you disclosed um, as your, um, uh, your, your self-reported income to the IRS. Uh, as a self-employed individual or a 1099 contractor, and you're dividing that by 12 and multiplying it by two and a half. Um, thankfully, uh, we have a guide at the U.S. Chamber, uh, uschamber.com, that's specifically for independent contractors that'll tell you how that is calculated. But the short answer is you're looking back to your prior year tax filings and what you disclosed uh, to the government as your earnings, either as a 1099 or a self-employed individual. Okay, got it. Um, this is an interesting question. Uh, can PPP funds be used to pay wages and bills between the time periods of eight and 24 weeks, or is it just an eight week time period or a 24 week time period? So could you pick a 16 week time period? You, you could, and this is a new change. Um, so the, the time period has, I think this is our third iteration of what the time period is. And so um, now the way the statute reads is that the time period uh, for which your expenses are calculated for loan forgiveness is a time period that begins for everyone. It begins when your loan is originated, when you receive that loan. And it ends at a date of your choosing that is between eight weeks after when you receive the loan, eight weeks after origination, but before 24 weeks after origination. 
So you get your loan, every bill that you're paying after that can count towards the loan forgiveness if it's an eligible expense. Once you hit that eight week mark, you can say, I've qualified for the full forgiveness. I'm going to terminate uh, you know, the, the calculations now and go to my lender for get forgiveness. Or you can keep going all the way until you reach 24 weeks after origination uh, before the time period ends. It's up to you now. Great. So I have an, an audience uh, question here that's kind of general, but I'm going to use it as an opportunity to just hit you with a lightning round for a second. So this is about timing to apply for funding. Um, so maybe we could just I, just go through each thing. So can you still apply for a P, regular PPP loan right now? As soon as the portal opens uh, and the SBA begins receiving uh, loan applications from lenders, yes. Uh, yes. So and you can then, go talk to your lender right now. They'll just tell you they're waiting on the SBA to reopen. That should happen any day now. When that happens, you can go get a first round PPP. And then when can you apply for the second one? So same thing. Uh, as soon as the SBA opens the portals and provides the, the, uh, the paperwork for lenders, you'll be able to go to your lender. They'll be able to help you submit an application for a second round PPP. So it should be any day now. We're just waiting on the SBA. And then the timing on the employee retention tax credit is essentially quarterly as you would file your payroll taxes, you would apply for the credit uh, at the that, same time. And that's, look, exactly, doing yeah, that, that's exactly right. And uh, you know, a, a lot of people will, will coming up on January 15th, looking back to 2019, I would be talking to your tax preparer right now to figure out if you can claim part of that tax credit for wages that you paid in 2019. Great, okay. Um, this person asks about what expenses can be paid with the PPP loan and also about salary limitations, which we haven't touched on in this uh, episode. So maybe we could talk about salary limitations again. Sure, so um, you may recall under the original PPP program, uh, it was limited, both the amount that you could borrow and the amount uh, that you could pay out in qualified wages using the PPP proceeds at an annual salary of $100,000. And so um, it obviously prorated over the two and a half months that you borrow or whatever time frame that you're, you're paying your employees. But you can't uh, receive a loan uh, for uh, more wages than a, a, what equates to $100,000 on an annualized basis, um, or receive loan forgiveness for paying an employee at a rate that would exceed $100,000 a year. Okay. This person asks if there are programs targeted towards self-owned businesses without employees beyond the owner. So the PPP you could use to pay your own salary, even if you're just one employee, right? That's exactly right. So self-employed individuals, um, do qualify for the PPP program, and you can use those proceeds uh, to compensate yourself in the same way that your income from your, your normal business would have compensated you. Okay. Um, this person says, what if you are a not-for-profit? Can we get an advanceable tax credit if we don't pay tax? Ah, so um, this is a great question about the employee retention tax credit. I'm glad uh, it was asked because there was a small caveat here for nonprofit organizations. So um, the, the specific answer to the question is, yes, you can receive the advanceable refundable tax credit as a nonprofit because you do remit payroll taxes on behalf of your employees. So um, you're still sending the payroll taxes that are withheld as a nonprofit uh, to the government reflecting their social security uh, withholding, for example. However, one of the rules, the quirky rules for nonprofits is that it only, you only qualify, the only wages that qualify for a nonprofit are wages that you're paying employees when they are not providing services. And it has to imply for the entire operation. So uh, in essence, the nonprofit has to essentially be shuttered in terms of providing normal services, but you have to continue paying your employees or at least paying their health care benefits in order to receive the credit. So this is one of the things I wish Congress would have fixed. Um, they fixed most of the rest of it. They didn't fix this aspect of it, uh, but this is not quite as valuable 
uh, if you are a nonprofit. Got it. Um, this is a practical question. For the PPP second draw, how do businesses prove their reduction in gross receipts? So what documentation would they need? Yeah, so great, I, I, great question that I wish I had a really specific answer for, uh, because it's one of the things that we're waiting on guidance and the actual application forms to come out from the Small Business Administration. Um, you know, we, we expect that they're going to try to make it simple, uh, that it's going to be some uh, added attestation uh, where you're going to have to supply the numbers and, and demonstrate that reduction in gross receipts. Uh, but until we get the formal guidance, uh, and the loan application out of the SBA, we, we can't say for certain. Got it. Um, this person says, I am eligible for the second PPP loan and the live venue grant. Now they think they can only accept one. So before I ask the question, if that's accurate, they can only do that one. Is true. If, okay. Yeah, if you, can only, you can only take one. Okay, so assuming, so now we know, yes, you can only take one. They say, can I apply for both and then just accept only one? Or like they're worried that if they apply for the one that would be their preference and then they don't get it, then the funds will have run out on the other one. Uh, and I think that's a very legitimate concern. Um, and so um, I, I can tell you what I would do personally. I won't provide any legal advice, but I'll tell you uh, what I would do personally. If I were in that situation, I would be preparing to apply for both. Um, we don't have the loan applications um, for the second draw PPP yet, and we don't have the grant applications for the live venue grant yet. When those are, are published, I'd look at both of them and see if there's anything that prohibits you from applying for both at the same time. Um, if not, you might be able to, to do that and then simply decline one once it's approved. But the key steps are, I think it's prudent to prepare but you're going to want to review those legal documents, that grant application and that loan application uh, to make sure that you can do that before you actually submit that paperwork. So those are the steps I would I would take if, if I were uh, uh, in that questioner's shoes. Um, this person asks about idle money for businesses not located in a low income neighborhood. So the idle loans are not related to the neighborhood income level. Is that correct? That's correct. And the, the way the law is drafted, it's, it's a, to say it's quirky is, is kind of quirkiness, I, I, I suppose. But um, the, the way it's set up is that the, the idle grants continue to exist, but there are targeted idle grants, those that go to those low income neighborhoods that we talked about. And when the SBA opens up, they're supposed to be giving priority to those idle grants for those targeted entities, fewer than 300 employees uh, located in that low income census tract that have experienced revenue loss. What we don't know is whether the applications from those targeted priority grants will exhaust the $20 billion that Congress has provided or not. Uh, and if it doesn't, then presumably there's going to be idle grant money uh, that's more widely available. It's just going to be a question of how big the demand is from the audience uh, that's receiving priority under this new legislation. Got it. Um, do you have to use the same lender if you for if you do both to PPP twice? Uh, there's certainly nothing in the statute that, re that requires to do that. I, you know, um, obviously the, you know, the lender that you used um, may have all the paperwork and it may be easier, but I, I'm not aware of anything, certainly in the statute that requires that. And I would be surprised if there's anything in the regulations that would require that. Um, this person asked about the 300 employee threshold, which I think was related to the employee retention tax credit. So or it's both, the, well, so no, for the, the 300 applies to um, the second draw PPP right. as well yeah. as the idle. So it's, right. uh, there's a 500 person test on the employee retention tax credit. So, right, I, I needed my slide and I couldn't see it. Um, so on that, they're asking about how you determine that head count, if that is um, full-time equivalent employees or and also what time period do they need to have had that employee level? 
Yeah, so um, with, it, it's likely gonna be a little bit different, um, uh, not to make matters more confusing, but but the, the reality of it is, is that uh, the, the PPP uh, basically doesn't use an FTE, it uses a, a simple headcount mechanism, just like the original PPP. Um, you are um, looking at it and, I'm trying to remember the exact time frames uh, in, in the application that it references. And I apologize, I don't remember that off the top of my head, but there is a time frame there. Um, if you if you pull up uh, the the loan application form, uh, which I believe remains on the Treasury and SBA website, it should tell you that um, uh, when that time period is. Um, with respect to uh, the employee retention tax credit, you're really looking at the quarter in which you're operating. Um, and um, uh, I believe it's more of a regular FTE type determination. Um, notably, if you have more than 500 employees, you can still qualify for an employee retention tax credit, except the only wages that qualify for the credit are wages that you're paying to an employee who is not providing services. So someone who has essentially been furloughed you're continuing to pay or continuing to provide health benefits to um, those those costs to you that that pay or the cost of that health coverage qualifies towards the tax credit uh, if you have more than 500 employees is the employee retention tax credit good only for full-time employees um no but it's based on your wages so um, uh, we gave you the maximum amount, seven thousand dollars per quarter. Uh, but it, it's the, the way it's structured is that you receive a credit, a seventy percent credit, uh, on wages paid, and wages include uh, expenses that the employer pays for health benefits, for example. Seventy percent credit on what the employer pays, up to ten thousand dollars a quarter. So if you have an employee that uh, you only pay $5,000 over the course of three months, you can still qualify for the tax credit. It's simply going to be 70% on that $5,000. Okay. Um, they, this person is asking about how to um, apply for a PPP loan. Like, is it through a bank? And so I think that's a good question because I know it was so confusing in the beginning because there was an application form issued by the IRS, but that wasn't actually the, the form you would use, or the SBA, I think it was. So it, it is the form you use, but you go to your lender. So um, what the SBA and the Treasury Department provided was a standard unified loan application uh, that lenders would use in taking your loan and making the application for the PPP loan. And so uh, it's gonna operate the same way. At the end of the day, you're filling out you know, one standard form, but you have to go to your lender to get that form submitted, get that loan made, and have that form submitted to uh, the SBA for, for processing. So the form that you get online is the form you're going to file with your lender. It just helps you kind of get a head start on um, all the information you're going to need to provide. Got it. Um, this person... Said that they applied for the PPP loan, but they won't be seeking forgiveness because they ended up using it to pay vendors and other non qualifying expenses. Um, can they still apply for the second round of PPP loans, assuming they mean that they think this time they will qualify for forgiveness? So, um, again, based on the statute, we don't see any barrier to that. We'll want to see the regulations. Uh, there is a requirement that you have exhausted your PPP funds, but there's not a requirement that you have received forgiveness for that original PPP loan in order to get the second draw. So um, I, I would, if I were uh, in, in the questioner's shoes, I would absolutely uh, be looking at a, a second draw PPP if I've exhausted um, all of my original PPP, even though I may not qualify for full forgiveness. Got it. Is um, this person wants to know, do you anticipate or is there a general anticipation that demand will outweigh supply? Like, will the PPP second draw run out of money? It's a, it's a great question. We don't know. Um, so obviously this is 
more targeted than the original PPP program. Um, you know, the fact that you have to demonstrate that 25% drop in gross receipts uh, in a quarter relative to the same quarter uh, the year prior uh, is going to mean that some folks who received an original PPP won't qualify for a, for a second draw. Um, it's also going to mean um, uh, the 300-person headcount means that there are some people who have a, a more than 300 employees, but less than 500 who qualified before who won't qualify now. We just don't have a good sense of uh, how that's going to shake out and what demand's going to be. You know, um, I, I think it's it. I think it's always good to be better safe than sorry. Um, so if if you believe you qualify, you believe this is something that you want to do, I'd be getting everything ready right now. I'd be letting my lender know I want to apply for that second draw. I want to get in there. I, I want to get my application submitted um, just because you're, you're better off um, uh, getting ahead of it and, and uh, rather than worrying about running out of funds. Are an employer's portion of payroll taxes includable as payroll for loan forgiveness purposes? Employers, um, oh, this is testing my knowledge of the original PPP. Um, I, 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 to be honest, I have to go back and look. I can't. Th there is a there is a differentiation. I believe the answer is this, but I, I want to go back and double check that. Um, that was a, a question that arose in the original PPP program. I can tell you they did not change the rules in this new law. So whatever was the rule before remains the rule. But um, uh, that's one I want to double check before I give bad information. Okay. Um, maybe we can cover that in our next. We'll make sure we cover that next time. Um, the live venue grant is only part of, so having a live venue is only part of this person's business. So would only that portion of their revenue be applicable to this live venue? So, yeah, so there are very specific definitions um, in uh, the legislation about what it means to be a live venue event operator. And so, um, you have to have certain attributes of ticket sales, for example. You uh, actually have to have sound equipment um, if you're putting on a live venue or um, theater production equipment or projection equipment. And so um, it, it can't be the case that you, uh, for example, uh, run a restaurant and, you know, um, you might have a stand up a free stand-up mic or a coffee shop with a stand-up mic and say, okay, well, I'm a live venue operator, therefore I qualify. That's not the case. You have to be principally in the business, deriving uh, most of your revenue from that actual live event, that theatrical production, um, uh, that musical performance, and selling those tickets and promoting that. And you have to meet those very specific definitions. So, um, you know, a good way if, 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 you're really wondering whether you meet that or not. Uh, we're gonna be putting out a new guide to this that details all of those things. Uh, but in the meantime, you can simply go to congress.gov um, and you can look up at this, this most recent law and it'll spell all of those things out. Let's, this is a good time to uh, go over the allowable expenses. Um, this says, this person said, can, we claim business operation expenses as part of the PPP loan. Like, can you give examples of operations expenses? Yeah, so uh, this is another new change. I mentioned, for example, the uh, the expenses related to plexiglass or the drive through window that you can now claim. There are certain business operation expenses that are now allowable, uh, particularly having to do with accounting programs, system hardware, uh, basically things that you would have expended funds on, um, in short, to be able to comply with all these requirements of the PPP program. Um, so there is some limited business operation expenses um, that now qualify for loan forgiveness. Uh, this is another area where I think more definition uh, coming out of the SBA would be useful and exactly what that means. Um, we're fairly certain it's not going to be 
every business operation expense that you have that that clearly is not what uh, the new law intends but certain software uh, accounting processes uh, cloud computing services things that you've bought to be able to track all of these expenses for your ppp loan can now that expense can qualify for free and just to confirm, the second draw PPP program will also be forgivable. Is that correct? That's exactly right. And so uh, the expenses will be the same that are forgivable, including those new expanded expenses that we just talked about. The 6040 rule will still be in place on that second draw loan. So it's still the case that if you want to uh, maximize your loan forgiveness, at least 60% of your total loan. Uh, that you receive, you have to use for those payroll expenses. And so if you only spend 50% of the, the loan that you received on payroll expenses, you're not going to have your entire loan forgiven. Okay. Uh, I think that we had this question once before. I think this is driving people crazy. It says our PPP loan was recently forgiven. What, how would you qualify this as a journal entry? It says, or is it destined to forever be classified as other income? So I guess they're asking, have you heard anybody's um, advice on how to deal with this? I have not, that, that is a, I, it's a great question. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's a, a accounting industry best practice yet on, uh, on, on how it's done. Um, but it's a great question. We'll we'll try to talk to some of our colleagues and see if we can find an answer. Um, this is another one about documentation. How do you prove that you exhausted the first loan? What documentation do you provide? Yeah, again, this is something we don't have the loan application yet for the second draw PPP. Um, we don't know what kind of documentation uh, they're they're going to require. Um, Clearly, you know, one way to think about it is you're going to have to be well past that. You're going to have to be past that eight week window. Right. So if you actually this wouldn't there's actually no way this is possible because no one's gotten a loan since September. But, you know, in theory, if you got a loan five weeks ago, you can't immediately get a second draw PPP loan. That will be true. For example, some people may go for the original PPP when the window reopens and then exhaust that and go for the second draw. You, you could do that but you'll obviously have to be past that, that eight week window to do that. But beyond that, we don't, um, we don't know what kind of documentation uh, will be required. This person's question is, are women owned businesses considered minority owned businesses? But I'm asking you this question specifically because I want to, I think it's lead, it's, it's, indicative of a misunderstanding, I think. So uh, when we talked about money being set aside for minority owned businesses, just to clarify that I understand, that doesn't mean that you would go to anyone and prove that you are a minority owned business or a woman owned business. What I think you said is that this means that money was set aside for organizations who traditionally specialize in providing funding to businesses in either who are minority owned or in underserved areas. So that this question about being woman owned is not necessarily a, an issue of like, will you or will you not qualify? So is that correct? So now you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly right. The money set aside um, for uh, small businesses in areas that traditionally have had minority owned small businesses and money is set aside for lenders who have traditionally served minority owned businesses but there's no special set aside uh, based on uh, the status of the owner themselves. Right, okay, just wanted to clarify that. Um, we've talked about documents to, to get your PPP loan forgiven, but this person's asking about documents to apply for the PPP loan. Okay, so um, let's start with some good news uh, that we haven't talked about yet. If your PPP loan is for less than $150,000, they are gonna have an expedited loan forgiveness process. It is supposed to be, by law, it is supposed to be a one page application uh, for loans smaller than $150,000 for forgiveness. So uh, this is gonna reduce a lot of paperwork hassle uh, for folks who received a loan less than $150,000. In terms of documentation for your original PPP loan, um, the, the, the fundamental uh, documentations elements that you have to provide haven't changed. So go to uschamber.com, 
go to our, our small business guide for these uh, small business loans and it'll outline the, the, the information that you're going to need there. Um, you can also go look at the application uh, for the original PPP that exists on the SBA's website or the Department of Treasury's website. That's treasury.gov or sba.gov. And you can see the information that you're going to need there. That hasn't fundamentally changed. One thing that has changed is um, if you're applying for a loan, the new loan limit is going to be $2 million maximum loan rather than the old maximum loan limit of 10 million. But other than that, the documentation you're going to need, um, uh, the qualifications, those remain the same. Great. And Neil, we started a little late. We were supposed to end at three, but we're going to go for an extra like five minutes. So audience don't hang up yet because we have a few more questions for Neil. Um, Neil, everyone wants to talk about this uh, live events venue um, assistance. So do catering halls uh, apply? Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I'm misunderstanding this question. They're asking if catering halls can apply for the new PPP round, but I'm wondering if they're really asking about the live event. So could you answer both questions? Well, certainly uh, catering halls could qualify for the, the, the PPP, um, uh, original PPP, uh, if they've had the more than 25% reduction in, in gross receipts, which knowing how hard hit the industry has been, I, I suspect that they have, they can qualify for the, the second draw. Um, I think it's going to be more difficult, um, uh, perhaps to qualify for the live venue grant. Um, and so uh, the qualifications there are a little bit more stringent. It really is tied into uh, going after theater companies and uh, music halls and um, uh, uh, spaces that put on live performances and sell tickets to those live performances. That's really kind of the fundamental um, uh, group of businesses that they're trying to assist with that live venue grant. This person is asking about independent contractors who work in the events industry. So we know that they can't apply for that assistance from the live venue, but what are resources are available to them? The idle loan and the PPP loan? Absolutely. So that that idle uh, loan uh, or, or grant is available to you. The PPP may be your best bet. If you're an independent contractor um, and, and you're in, in, in that industry or, or another industry um, and you've had a disruption uh, in your income, the, the PPP program is a great place to go uh, because you're really talking about two and a half months worth of uh, wage replacement. Um, for you uh, if if you've been impacted in that way. This person wants to know if an independent, um, if a self-employed person can use the employee retention tax credit. Um, there are special rules for self-employed individuals who uh, remit uh, in, uh, uh, employment taxes. Um, those are, are pretty specified. Um, it's a great issue for us to dive into next time because uh, the rules are a little, they're a little different, a little tired to really design, uh, but there are some special rules uh, for, for the self-employed. Great. I'm going to end with this question. It's really more of a philosophical question, but I'd be curious to hear your answer. And obviously so with this person. So I think it's really about the intent behind the PPP loans. So they, she said, or he, she or he says, I would love to get some clarification on the necessity of the new PPP loans. We used our loan from 2020 and we've seen a 35% decrease in business for two quarters, but we're not about to go bankrupt. So just, I think people are curious, like, should they take this loan if they meet the qualifications, but they're not about to go out of business? Like, is there some, is that unethical? Should they not be doing that? Do you, can you just talk about the, the intent behind the law or the, the stimulus? Yeah. So let's go all the way back to the original PPP program. Um, one of the most common questions we answered at the time was um, this, this is really, they're asking employers to take the loan and to pay their employees, even if their employees aren't working, even if their place of business uh, isn't open. Yes, that's exactly right. The intent of Congress was to help small businesses keep their employees on the payroll through this forgivable loan. 
And so the, the whole design around it was to help small businesses keep their employees on the payroll. The second draw PPP is, is really has the same purpose. So, you know, the, the, the requirements, the basis that the loan uh, amount is based on how much you, your uh, payroll costs are. The fact that forgiveness is tied to how much you spend on payroll costs. The intent is exactly the same. The only difference is, is that they've targeted this second draw PPP to those businesses who um, have had more of an economic hit maybe than some other businesses have experienced. Hence that, that requirement for that 25% reduction in revenue. As, as to whether the questioner should apply for a loan, you know, that, you know, that's a decision everyone's gonna have to make for themselves. Um, um, you know, and thinking through your business operations, your ability uh, to retain your employees, um, if it brings on the opportunity to maybe bring an employee back, uh, for example. So um, in anticipation of when the vaccine's uh, distributed and economic activity resumes, I know a lot of small businesses are, are gearing up for that and want to be able to bring some employees back. This may help you do that. But those are obviously all factors that, that the small business owners are going to have to work out for themselves. But bottom line, you don't have to be filing for bankruptcy to. No, no. And, and in fact, the whole goal is we don't want you filing for bankruptcy. We right. want to keep you afloat. And more importantly, we want to, we want to keep you uh, in a position where you can keep paying your employees. That's the whole goal. Great. That is a great place to end. So thank you, Neil, so much for your time today. It's, this is so much information and we will do this again. Um, on Tuesday, uh, January 19th, again at 2 p.m. Eastern. So everyone can join us again then. Audience, thank you so much for your time. And there is more information in this fantastic guide that the Chamber created uh, to the COVID relief package. It's right on your screen under the window where you're watching us now. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Neil. And we will see you next time. Happy New Year. Bye-bye.